Since its launch in 2018, the South African Investment Conference has brought the world to South Africa to showcase the investment opportunities available in the most industrialized economy on the continent. To date, the conference has attracted more than 700 billion rand worth of investment commitments. As South Africa seeks to recover from its economic challenges exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic, tackling unemployment, poverty and equality and rather inequality remain a key priority for the government. The latest investment conference highlighted the strengths and competitive advantages that South Africa offers and why it remains a choice investment destination. Pledges received in the first three investment conferences amounted to roughly 64% of the five-year investment mobilization drive target of 1.2 trillion rand. Now the fourth conference has concluded and today we focus on how South Africa is aiming high with its investment conference. This is Business Edge. I'm Tolu Lokwe, Adilaru Balogun. Now joining me from Pretoria, South Africa, is Yunus Hussein. He is the Deputy Director General and CEO of Invest SA, which was created to focus on investment promotion through investment information, facilitation, support, and more. Yunus, welcome to Business Edge. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, good afternoon, and thank you for having me, and good afternoon to your viewers. Fantastic. So let's start this conversation by quickly looking back at the third investment conference where there were pledges of around 774 billion rand. Did that particular conference meet its own investment mark? Because this series of conference has an overall target, we've heard from the president of South Africa, and each one is building upon the progress and success of the last one. So the, uh, the third one in question, did it meet its own target, helping to get South Africa towards where it's going? Yes, certainly. I mean, in all the conferences, we've been ahead of the target. Uh, and this one year, uh, in 2022, we would have been, uh, if you look at the investment mobilization drive announced by the president in 2018, it's a hundred billion dollars, 1.2 trillion ran over a period of five years. So if you're looking at year four, our target would have been 80 percent. Uh, and last week, uh, Thursday with the announcements of uh, investment commitments and pledges, we had 95%. So we've increased the year four target at 15%. But the other three conferences that we did have, we didn't have one in uh, 2021 because of the COVID pandemic. Uh, we were always ahead of the target. And surprisingly for us, in the year three target of, of, of 774 billion rand, uh, we also have a monitoring and evaluation, which we track as an investment uh, essay, of that 774 billion rand, we had 40.9% of the, the funds that were flown into projects, uh, meaning that uh, mining shafts were built, uh, equipment was ordered, plants were constructed, and a number of projects completed. So in year three, we already had 46 of the 152 projects uh, that were pledged uh, completed. And a further 57 of them were in early phases of construction uh, or, or in construction, and, and, and a few of them in early stages of construction. And some of them uh, were a bit delayed due to the uh, COVID pandemic itself. Okay, and that really was my next question, because it's one thing to have the pledges and the commitments and for those to actually translate into projects and actual action on the ground. So in terms of how these pledges and commitments have translated for South Africa in the time that this conference has been in play, do you think you would call it successful? Has the project or rather has the investment conference throughout the numerous editions been able to truly um, hit the aim and the, um, the objective that it had and translate these commitments and pledges into projects? Yes. As I said, we have uh, 46 of them completed uh, and a number of projects, uh, what you call launches, uh, launches meaning factories are opening uh, a number of them happened in, in last year key amongst them were some of the major automotive ones uh, such as the Mercedes-Benz C-Class uh, plant in the Eastern Cape uh, 
uh, the Toyota plant, for example, in uh, on the East Coast and KZN. So a number of significant uh, investments have been realized. Uh, we've been able to open these plants and a number of launches are taking place this year, early this year itself. Uh, so we, we, we are, we, we track uh, these projects on a daily basis, but we have a monitoring and uh, evaluation report with the companies that have uh, made these announcements. Uh, in, by year three, there were 152, um, and this year we have uh, about another 80. So there will be 230 announced. So we track them in daily contact with these companies to address any challenges, impediments, uh, and, and quite uh, happy to say that in the three years itself, on the three-year drive of 2018, 2019, and uh, and 2020, we actually had companies that have expanded their investments uh, and increased their investments. You had a few that also decreased their investments uh, because of the COVID pandemic, and a, a very few of them have been cancelled itself. Mm. So let's look at this fourth conference. Now, as you said, of course, it comes about um, after the COVID-19 pandemic, the first physical convening of participants since 2019, and the world, by extension as well, investors have faced um, tough economic times, headwinds, recessions, and more. In particular, what were the expectations for this particular edition, given the fact that it would have been expected that money would be a bit tighter, investors would be a bit more reluctant or more um, deliberate about where they put their money? So what expectations did you guys have going into this fourth edition? It looked like for us, I think, when the president uh, announced investment mobilization drive, not only was it a target of uh, $100 billion over a period of five years, or 1.2 trillion rand, it also was a set of policy announcements, economic reforms tied to, to uh, the announcement. So the, the conference gives us an opportunity to take stock of these economic reforms as well as have a, a, a discussion with the public and private sector on how we 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 making good on these economic reforms. And I think a number of the reforms that have come into place uh, really stood us in good stead in terms of the investment promotion, promotion drive, the liberalization of the energy policy, for example, allowing private sector to invest in 100 megawatts uh, uh, private sector embedded generation uh, without a license. That was a significant achievement, uh, allowing the spectrum auction that happened last week where a number of the telcos bid and actually doubled the, 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 their investment uh, in that regard is the great policy initiatives that are moving and providing greater confidence for not only foreign investment, but also unlocking domestic investments, which we both track in these uh, conferences itself. Mm. And it's interesting you mentioned some of the challenges as well, because you mentioned that a bit earlier. And I want us to look at that before uh, we continue further. It's been a tough two years, not just for South Africa, but for the rest of the continent and the rest of the world. But in particular with South Africa, strict COVID-19 restrictions, civil unrest that happened last year as well, the continuing challenges with ESCOM and the electricity provision, and of course this inequality and the massive rates of unemployment put around 35% officially, and some even say around 50% unofficially. How do you think these issues may have or may continue possibly to affect how investors see the country? Look, I think this is part of the broad plan of our economic recovery and response uh, and working together with the private sector, working together with communities, working together with labor to chart a, chart a program where investment uh, can lead to uh, greater job creation, uh, can lead to uh, uh, reducing uh, unemployment and inequality and having a more greater spread of investment across the country uh, so that there's not only economic development in tier one cities. And I think what I was glad about this conference was that we had investment from both foreign and domestic, both big and small, um, both uh, giving opportunity for a number of uh, South African firms uh, the opportunity that are now playing in the manufacturing and production productive spaces, for example, in automotive, in a pharmaceutical value chain for medical supplies and, and pharmaceuticals itself. So giving a greater spectrum, a very broad, diversified uh, portfolio of investment that is actually now reaching uh, 
the nine provinces in South Africa and can do its bit to reduce those triple challenges of unemployment, inequality, and so forth. All right. So you mentioned, of course, the packages, economic reform packages. I want us to take a look more at that. So part of the work that Invest SA does um, is to facilitate investment. And you do that also by working with the government, particularly in terms of creating an enabling business environment. And we spoke about some of the challenges earlier. But in terms of moving forward, how are some of these challenges being addressed? You've talked about the 100 megawatts in terms of uh, private people getting involved in electricity generation. There's also the unemployment, particularly with Invest um, SA and looking how, at how you facilitate bringing investment in. What do you think needs to be identified and particularly prioritized by government in order to create that enabling business environment you're looking for? Look, in the president announced an uh, economic recovery and reconstruction plan in October 2020. As part of this, we set up a unit between the National Treasury and the presidency called Operation Vulindela. And we're now seeing fruits. Operation Vulindela deals with a number of our structural uh, reforms, particularly in the network industries. We've already set up a legal entity for the Ports Authority in which tra Transnet uh, uh, Port Authority is a subsidiary of Transnet. We're moving forward in terms of the ESCOM, the utility, uh, unbundling it into three uh, units in terms of uh, distribution, generation, and as well as transmission. Uh, so, and then we're looking at the overall ease of doing business program, which we champion as as uh, on behalf of the government in terms of making it much more easier for companies to register business. We're also looking at overhauling the visa regime. A uh, number of countries now for tourism, we have e-visas. We've recently published a critical skills list uh, to attract uh, critical skills into South Africa. Uh, so there are there are a number of areas in which we're looking at how we can enhance the, the port inefficiencies. And then, as I said, there's significant areas in terms of the energy space, uh, which the uh, we have already concluded round five of the renewable energy independent power producer procurement program, as well as the risk mitigation independent power producer program, which uh, will have financial closure end of this month and end of April for the for the for the REAP. Uh, we will definitely uh, announce the round six for bidding of renewable energy. So these bring about some significant new sectors. We now see the the uh, the emerging sectors such as building uh, data center infrastructure uh, for the services sector, uh, also in terms of the creative industries, uh, attracting more innovation uh, into the country. So there's much more diversified portfolio of investment uh, and investment opportunities in areas of renewable energy, in the renew renewable energy components, uh, the green hydrogen space, um, and then the, for us, the, the, the biggest manufacturing sector is the automotive sector, transitioning from uh, internal combustion engines uh, to electric vehicles. Those, those are bringing some exciting opportunities. We've seen the uptick now uh, in the mining uh, and the commodity upswing, so further new investment in there. But we're looking at the other areas of how we uh, beneficiate the platinum into fuel cell and uh, fuel cell for batteries and so forth in, on the component side. So uh, linking that to a number of special economic zones that South Africa has, which are quite sector specific to attract these kind of new uh, sectors and new investment. Okay. So I think the African Development Bank was either one of the largest or possibly um, the largest committer or pledger at this fourth conference. And we had Dr. Akimumi Adeshina describing South Africa as we know South Africa is bankable. Now, the bank pledged $2.8 billion for the country over the next five years. And since 1997, the bank has invested about $7 billion in South Africa in energy and infrastructure. And seeing them take such a front and center position again at this fourth conference, you see that there's a really valuable relationship between South Africa and the Africa Development Bank. In terms of the projects that the bank has invested in over the years, have they really achieved their aims? Have they made a dent in the areas or the issues which the bank has helped to focus on with South Africa? Yes, certainly. I think something new in this year's conference, we had a number of funders and it's extremely pleasing to get uh, a 2.8 or 42.5 billion rand uh, uh, 
funding pledge from the African Development Bank. I think a significant amount of their uh, uh, investment has gone into infrastructure projects uh, in, in, in also linking that up to other countries such as Lesotho on the, uh, on the water side, uh, particularly on the energy side. So they, their investment in the past uh, seven years or so has been significant in terms of unlocking economic development uh, and supporting infrastructure. But this goes beyond that. It also talks to private sector investment uh, as well as infrastructure, small harbors and so forth. So very exciting for the African Development Bank to make that uh, commitment. But we also had other funders such as Norfund from Norway uh, making a pledge on uh, clean tech and agro-processing fund as well as Meridium, a French fund, uh, similarly looking at energy sector, infrastructure, uh, as well as uh, municipal um, uh, investment. So, so good to have uh, not only the direct investment, uh, which was significant, but good to have funds uh, pledging um, op- uh, funds such as also the, the, the new development bank uh, to look at uh, uh, opportunities to to invest in in exciting investment projects itself. Very true. Now it's always great to have international investors, but there's something about having domestic investors, having um, South Africans themselves who believe in this vision actually buy into it. And you've mentioned domestic investors once or twice, so let's quickly look at that in terms of the domestic investment that came out from the um, South African Investment uh, Conference. Were you surprised by the amounts? Were you surprised by the players who decided to? pledge or to put some money behind um, what South Africa is selling domestically? Look, I think uh, before we get to the domestic, I think a number of the multi... All right, it seems we're having a bit of connection issues with Yunus Hossein. He's the Deputy Director General and CEO of Invest SA, uh, which is, of course, the organization in South Africa which was created to focus on investment promotion through investment information, investment facilitation, and investment support. And we're just getting to the end of the conversation. Of course, a number of things that came out of the South African Investment Conference. I think Eunice is back. Are you back with me? Hello, Eunice. I am, I am with you. All right, fantastic. So you were about to talk. We, I asked you about the domestic investors, but you wanted to make a point before going to the domestic investors. Yes, what I was saying is that in, in our in the announcements, we've seen that number of the the multinationals have also expanded their investments of past. Uh, people like Procter and Gamble uh, and so forth, and then domestic investors, a significant number of them, particularly in the mining sector, uh, have come forward and and, and, excite, and uh, announced new mining. All right. Unfortunately, the connection does not want us to finish this conversation. And he was just about to touch base with basically the winners, which was how I wanted us to wrap this up. South Africa is not the only country that has this sort of investment promotion uh, conference, but it is one that many investors and many across the continent also keep their eye on. This is the fourth edition that wrapped up last week. And as President Sarah Mposa has put it, it is the edition that brings them out of COVID, one where he talked about being optimistic about the country's potential, even in the midst of the challenges the country faced. Now, the conference aims to raise $1.2 trillion Rand, 1.2 trillion Rand by its fifth year, which would be next year, 2023. And the president announced that they were about 90% uh, towards that in terms of how much they had raised so far. A number of investments coming from uh, multinationals as well as domestic players in this as well. As I told you earlier, the African Development Bank pledged $2.8 billion uh, to South Africa over the next five years. Some 400 of that will go to... Um, support South Africa's ESCOM as well as the country's energy transition. So that's about 400 million, translated to about 6 billion rand, will go to ESCOM and the country's energy transition. Um, and currently the AFDB's active portfolio in South Africa comprises of 23 operations with a total commitment of about $4.5 billion in financing. Major sectors that got some boost. You heard the mining sector got some fantastic boosts there, as well as energy. We also had the creative energy, uh, the creative space as well, getting some money coming in. But it is the fourth South Africa investment conference that wrapped last week. We're speaking to Yunus Hossein, the Deputy Director General and CEO of Invest Africa, Invest South Africa, as we looked at 
um, the consequences and, of course, the highlights of that conference. Hopefully, we'll be able to have him back and continue this conversation another day. Unfortunately, time is not on my side. What I have left to do, I need to give you a few stories we're keeping our eyes on. And we have NC4 to watch coming up next. And as we look at stories we're keeping our eyes on, we start in South Africa where the rand retreated from a five-month high against the dollar early on Monday as the greenback strengthened with China's re-imposition of a lockdown in Shanghai impacting risk-taking. This morning, the rand trended at around 14 rand 61 cents against the dollar, 0.43% weaker than its close on Friday when it touched 14 rand 47 cents, the strongest level since October 21 after the bank the central bank that is raised the repo rate moving to west africa ghana expects an economic rebound as it opens to as it moves to open land and sea borders to mark the end of covid 19 restrictions imposed at the beginning of the pandemic starting from monday fully vaccinated travelers will be allowed entry through land and sea borders without a negative pcr test result Citizens and foreign residents in Ghana who aren't fully vaccinated will be required to produce a negative 48-hour PCR test result and will be offered vaccination on arrival. Gold dropped as the U.S. dollar strengthened, sapping demand for the safe haven assets after a weekly advance. It climbed 1.9% last week as the war in Ukraine burnished gold's haven appeal while holding an exchange-traded fund backed by the metal rising for a 10th straight week. Investors are seeking a store of value amid inflationary pressures stoked by soaring commodity prices, partly caused by the conflict in Europe and the ensuing sanctions. And finally, oil retreated as China's worsening virus resurgence raised concerns about demand in the world's biggest crude importer, while rebels in Yemen announced a temporary pause in hostilities against Saudi Arabia. WTI and Brent futures fell more than 3% in Asian trading after Shanghai said it would lock down half of the city in turns to conduct mass COVID-19 testing to try and stem an outbreak. Yemen's Houthi rebel leader announced a three-day truce on Saturday after an escalation of attacks on the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia over the past week. A lot of fluid and developing stories that are kicking us off this business week, so do stay with us right here on News Central for all the latest, not just from here on the continent, but of course across the world. And don't forget, 11 a.m. West African time, we put African business front and center, as well as the economy and financial news. I'm Tolu Lokwe, Adela Rubalogun. I'll see you soon.